Lord God, what an appropriate song to sing as we lead into um, the taking of the Lord's Supper this morning, Lord. Um, what an amazing gift it is to be able to cling to the cross, to be able to know the truth of the gospel, um, to be able to put our trust in you, Lord. Um, help my words be clear this morning, Lord. Help us to be able to shepherd our hearts well as we approach um, the taking of the bread and the cup. In your name, amen. Thank you for being here this morning. Um, there are men in the front with Bibles. We'd love to get one in your hands if you don't have one. Um, just raise your hand and they'll hand it out to you. Um, and if you don't have a Bible and you need one, that's our gift to you. And we'll be looking at Psalm 31 here in a few minutes. Um, so if you want to go ahead and turn there, uh, I'll, I'll get there in a sec. This week's been a tough one. I could list off many ways that it's been tough, but ultimately what was most difficult was I got into the trap of looking at my circumstances instead of worshiping God through them. I can have a tough week at work. I can run into issues that are emotionally exhausting or just struggle with everyday things. But if I look at through that eye, if I look at those circumstances through the eyes of wanting comfort, then I'm doing it wrong. It's just plain unhelpful. So when I see my mind and thought life going the way it did this week, I immediately turn to the Psalms. In the Psalms, David many times was shepherding his own heart in prayer and song to the Lord by telling him truths about his circumstance. And so this week I went to Psalm 31, and that's what I want to talk about today. This entire psalm is a great contrast of a lament psalm and a psalm of thanksgiving. Um, the heart behind the psalm matches my heart very often. The psalm begins with five verses that are a cry for help, followed by a profession of confidence in God, which leads to a heart of prayer. David concludes, certain of God's protection and calling upon Israel to join him in, the loving, in loving the Lord. I would like to dive into the profession of confidence in the middle of this psalm. So we're going to look at verses 7 and 8 together. Read along with me as I read them. I will rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness because you have seen my affliction. You have known the troubles of my soul and you have not given me over into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a large place. These verses, David makes a proclamation about the joy he takes in God's loving kindness. David says, I will rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness. In the midst of trial, David is shepherding his heart with truth. He knows where he needs to focus, and that is on Yahweh's loving kindness. He knows that his perspective needs to shift from himself and onto his Lord. He knows that his disposition needs to shift from brokenness towards gladness. As we come to the Lord's table this week, we need to do the same thing. I don't know where your focus has been amongst your circumstances this week. I know that many of you already do this very well. I know that as Jacob teached us, taught us a few weeks ago that we need to have a God is near attitude and I've seen many of us applying that well. Um, but it's always good to remember to reposition our eyes towards God and our hearts towards him amongst difficult circumstances. So David does this with four truths about God. He declares that he must rejoice and be glad in Yahweh's loving kindness, but then he grounds that joy in truths he already knows to be true. Let's look at those together. The first truth that David shepherds his heart with is that God has seen his affliction. Note what this doesn't say. It doesn't say that God has protected him from affliction. It says that he has seen it. However, I think the scene is so much more than a quick thought about what this, a quick thought about it. Spurgeon describes this by saying, God has seen it, weighed it, directed it, fixed a bound to it, and in all ways made it a matter of tender consideration. A man's consideration means the full exercise of his mind. What must God's consideration be? The second truth is that God has known the troubles of David's soul. This is so much deeper than mere circumstance. Have you ever had a time where you deal with troubles and are just spent at the end of them. These may be unverbalized troubles, but they're deep, and you don't even have it in you to articulate them. 
I believe this is the type of trouble that David is referring to here. And he is saying that he will take joy in God's loving kindness because God knows his unspoken troubles. The verb to know here tells us that God has intimate fellowship with David in the midst of his suffering. What a sweet assurance. The third truth that God, is that God has not given him over into the hand of the enemy. This is significant. Yahweh knows our affliction, but he has not given us over to our antagonist. As bad as any situation may be, the grace of God that comes from not being completely handed over to the devil is a sweet mercy of our Lord. The fourth and final truth that David shepherded his heart towards joy with was that God has set his feet in a large place. This phrase wasn't immediately obvious to me in understanding what setting your feet in a large place means. What, but I think this can be translated as an idiom. For example, you have untied my ropes or you have removed my wall. I believe that David is looking forward to future victory here. He knows he is in a trial, but he knows there is hope. He wasn't aware of the fullness of this statement, but we are. We know that Jesus came to die for our sins. We know that if we put our trust in him, we will be saved. We have so much more understanding of the truth that David proclaimed in this psalm, and that is very sweet. In the midst of the lament of Psalm 31, David shepherds his heart towards God in four, with four truths. He reminds himself that God has seen his affliction, God knows his trouble, God has not given him over to the enemy, and that this isn't the end of the battle. As you prepare your heart for the Lord's table, I ask that you do the same. If you are here this morning, but you are one that doesn't put your faith in Jesus to save you from your sins, maybe by your own examination, you fight against the idea of a true God and one that would send his son to die for you, I want to speak to you for a minute. I want you to think about this same section in a very real way. In the midst of a difficult circumstance, where do you find your joy? Jesus came to the earth to save sinners. This act of love and mercy is put on, put on full display when we confess our sins and see his position towards us change through Christ's death on the cross. I want to beg you this morning, recognize your sin. Understand how God sees your sin and seek his forgiveness. He asks you to believe in him for eternal life. Put your faith in him and he will forgive those sins. You can do that right now. However, if you do not, please let the cup and bread pass you by. This is a time of communion where those who do put their trust in God worship him. If you have any questions, please see me after the service or one of the elders or the person that brought you. Um, we would love to tell you about our Savior. Men, can you please come serve us? And you can take communion on your own this morning.